my name is Eugene Perry, and up till quite recently, I had the pleasure of serving on the Board of Trustees of this uh, August Center. I um, started off in a lowly position of a member of the Nominations Committee, and then went on to chair the Program Committee, and I retired from the Board as the Vice Chair of the Board and Chair of the Executive. So, I would like to claim that I know a little bit about the center. Uh, I'm the chair for this uh, afternoon session. And a um, little bit about myself. I cut my teeth in this consultative group uh, system of centers, IITA, Nevada, uh, uh, the Africa Rice Center, now based in Cotonou, but based in Cote d'Ivoire at the time when I was its director general and worked at the World Bank. And in the, in the CG system, at that, in that first set of um, uh, uh, pres my presence there, I was uh, mostly on staff. And then I was elevated to being on board. So I served on the IMI board, I served on the ICRAP board. I worked with uh, Tony, and uh, had the pleasure of being asked to serve on this board, and I enjoyed my, my period on this board thoroughly. Thank you to Dino and to the rest of the staff for the support you gave me while I was a uh, member of the board, and for the opportunity to learn more about this, the work of this center. If we are to achieve the results that we uh, hope to achieve uh, in terms of the goals of uh, goal number five and number six of what is now called temporarily, I believe, the post-2015 UN Sustainable Development Goals in terms of food and nutrition security in terms of improvement of agricultural systems and increased uh, rural prosperity. If we, if we were to achieve this, uh, I think it's imperative that we must have a solid grasp of the challenges and the opportunities uh, for tropical vegetables because of the very important role that tropical vegetables are going to play. Uh, in, this, uh, in the achievement of these goals. Uh, in this next keynote address, Dr. Jackie Hughes, uh, the World Vegetable Center, VRDC Deputy Director General for Research, will take us through and share with us some of her insights into the uh, what she's calling a fresh look forward for tropical vegetables. We are indeed fortunate uh, to have Jackie make this presentation, given that uh, she is a member of the, the team that is commissioned by the UN for the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. So who better to give us those insights? Jackie, Thank you very much, Eugene. Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to talk to you for 40 minutes or so on a fresh look forward for tropical vegetables. I want to set the scene for you and explain what we and the world currently do, and perhaps could do better, and what we're all doing to improve upon the status quo. The status quo is not good enough, and we've heard that this morning through the keynote address this morning by Professor Lee, and then on during the conversation. And there are some other technologies we could and should be using, and I will take a look at those as well. But first, to make sure you know what I'm talking about, vegetables. We have global vegetables. They traditionally have originated from temperate regions. And they're not particularly or not necessarily well adapted to minimal seasonal variation in the tropics. They originated where there are hot and cold seasons, where there was some ex 
not real extreme of temperature or precipitation, but there was continental influences and so on. And these crops were then transferred to the tropics. They're also basically not resistant to tropical pests and diseases. So we have that one side of the picture. So when we look at traditional vegetables, they're either endemic crops which originate in different parts of the world where people traditionally eat them, or occasionally have been introduced and are now taken as part of the traditional diet. Some of these vegetables, the temperate ones, have only been widely consumed in their new areas for tens or hundreds of years and haven't had a great deal of time to be adapted to their new environments. But the traditional crops are very well adapted. So we have an interesting challenge there to make sure that the introduced crops perform extremely well in challenging environments that we have in the tropics. And these challenges, they are many. Are they challenges or are they opportunities? I believe they are both. And they cover all the things we've been talking about this morning, from climate change to urbanization, pests and diseases, policies which don't quite do what they're supposed to do, the issue of waste that was brought up this morning. But then so much is known now about nutrition, about technologies. We know how to create income opportunities. We like to believe we know how to empower women, but we could do that better. And globalization is a big plus, and maybe it's not. I'll go into that later. But just to remind you, climate change, climate events, I think we're all familiar with them, the droughts, the cold waves, the floods. We have them here. We're very used to climatic events here. But is it global warming? We heard that as well this morning. Global warming in a historical context, yes. As you see, average temperature rises at Rothamsted. Four degrees C over 100 years. Average change per 100 years in Taiwan, in Shanghua, 4.3 4 degrees C predicted per 100 years, based on data from 1975 to 2011. That's one of the strongest increases predicted around the world. So we have that issue going on as well, and the accompanying climatic events. Now, as somebody said, or as Professor Lee said this morning, you know, we have these major temperature changes during the day. Today was very pleasant early in the morning. It's got a little bit hotter now. What does it really matter? Well, it does matter to vegetables. Small increases in temperature can affect pollen viability and fruit set. We have lines that are okay. We have lines that are not okay. And for example, I was in Washington, D.C. a couple of months ago. And in USA, they were saying, we have vegetable gardens at home. We have our tomatoes. They taste really bad this year. And I asked them to cut them open. Guess what? No seed set. No tasty mucilage inside the fruit because they had had a very hot spell at some point. I suppose that was the reason. Or they were using the wrong varieties, which is also possible. So as you can see, there's an issue there. Tomatoes are not the only crop that's affected, but it's just an example for you. Then we have all these other stresses. Salt tolerance. It's not just something that happens when people misuse fertilizers or irrigate wrongly. Um, His Excellency yesterday from Tuvalu, we were reminiscing that water comes up through the sand around the government offices on extremely high tides and that will kill the vegetables. And he was discussing whether there are other options to provide vegetables in Tuvalu. There are lines which have good tolerance for these sort of issues. Um, Solanum pimpinellifolium, a wild type of tomato, has good tolerance to salinity stress. And we can get the genes from that into our cultivated tomatoes. A critical thing you heard about the gene bank this morning from Anna Lee, we have to have that gene bank. We have to have the diversity of genetic resources. We need to understand the genes that are available, and we have to have technologies to get those genes across into the varieties, the lines that you like to eat. 
With changing temperatures, the biotic stresses that we know about, the bacteria, the viruses, the fungi, the insects, they will all go up and down depending whether they prefer the heat, prefer the wet, and so on. Um, but we're seeing that very much in Taiwan with tomato yellow leaf curl. It's spreading. The Taiwan strain is spreading, but there are always confounding factors. It's not easy just to take the simple solution that it is a new strain, but there were resistance genes deployed in the <coughs> tomatoes that were released, and that has, it complicates the analysis. And I'm just trying to say that it's such a complexity going on, a simple solution is not that easy to figure out. When you look at pests, those things with six legs and sometimes a few more, um, when it gets warmer or colder, their range changes. If they spread into a new area, they're called invasive species, which is opportunistic movement to a new environment. Higher temperatures, they can reproduce more quickly until they get really hot and then they may cook. They move a lot faster when they're hot. When it's colder, they tend to slow down. Another problem for insects is unsuccessful mating at high temperatures, pupil death. That's kind of okay, they're all pests, but they're not because we have natural enemies. They're also affected. We have the pollinators. We were hearing about bees this morning. They're affected too by temperature, climatic changes. Other biocontrol agents we may choose to deploy, they are affected as well. So it's not a simple, an insect will increase if it gets a little warmer. It's not that simple. And if you look at tomato diseases, for example, if you increase, for every small increase in temperature, you'll go from powdery mildew to more early blight to more fusarium wilt. You increase from powdery mildew to a preponderance of late blight. This can be mapped, it can be understood. It's not so easy to deal with. Now, we have population growth. We were talking about that this morning. And predicted population growth, it's very high in Asia and in Africa. And you see that um, in Asia, the differences are getting bigger and bigger, Africa too, somewhat in the Americas. But the agriculturally active population is predicted to stabilize and start to fall in Asia as we get moving to 2013, 14, 15. In Africa, the agricultural population is predicted to still increase, but it's falling in the Americas and in Europe, and in Oceania, it's actually a little stable at the moment. So we have a big problem there. In Africa, we've got more farmers, but in other countries, we're gonna have fewer. So to maximize productivity, I think you've all seen things like this. You've seen the uh, polytunnels and net tunnels um, in Vietnam. They've got a lot of protective structures now. Um, it looked really nice before they developed. Development brought all of this. It brought more money, but did it bring, bring a better quality of life? I'll leave that to you to consider. Um, in Mauritius, they've got a lot of net houses. In Brunei, they're trying to become self-sufficient in vegetables, a lot of protected agriculture coming along. The advantages for this technology is that it's easier to use integrated pest management in a controlled environment. You can probably minimize spraying with pesticides. But within this context, some sort of limited monocropping is becoming a norm on a small scale, but it's becoming a norm. We talked about losses, 40% losses were mentioned this morning. If you look at uh, tomatoes, for example, in India, this is the amount that reaches the consumer, 50%, with losses due to off-farm post-harvest losses, on-farm losses, pests and diseases, and other constraints. 
in chilies, only 44% of the produce is reaching the market. That's an incredible amount of loss. I'll talk a bit more about loss later, but I want to highlight right at the beginning is not just an issue for Europe, it's not just an issue that is in some distant farm, it's a reality on our doorsteps. As we look more at rural and urban areas, we have a predicted decreasing rural population. In addition to the changes in the agricultural population numbers, we have a <coughs> predicted the rural urban, this is the urban population by 2043, and the rural is falling, which means that you have encroachment onto vi arable land, producing land for houses, for farms. You also have opportunistic vegetable production in urban areas. You have the use of grey water, con potentially contaminating your crops, pesticide misuse, heavy metal contamination, which are all major disadvantages to the uninformed growers in urban areas. And, of course, the consumers. Now, getting back to food waste, it's a really, uh, I heard, scary amount this morning. It is. The amount of food wasted globally is more than the total, more than could be produced on the total land area of China and India combined somewhat less than the Russian Federation could produce if all its land was arable. There's wastage on the way to and from the, to the market, sorry, and in the market, at supermarkets, and wastage in restaurants and in our homes. One of my pet constra uh, constraints on wastage issues at the moment is in the so-called developed countries, the use of these sell-by dates, best before dates, use-by dates, where a lot of the produce is still good, but you can't, even, you can't even feed it to pigs in Europe. Here you can, but in Europe you can't, or at least in Great Britain you can't. And I clearly, I do understand the reasons why this has come into force. It's for your health, but is it the right way of moving forwards when you have hungry people on the streets of cities in Europe too. And to bring it just to a practical matter, if you look in Oceania and you, have, you look at uh, eggplant, within 48 hours of harvest, 27% of the eggplant is unsaleable. It's wrinkled, dehydrated. Four days after picking, 38% of the tomatoes are rotted by the time they reach the market. Very poor post-harvest treatment, but nonetheless, we'd hope more of it would reach the market. In the greater Mekong, one constraint is they can't sell all the produce because of gluts, but adverse storage, poor packing, and so on. There's definitely things we can do. And if you just look in a little more detail, you'll see physical losses as opposed to quality losses. There's a big difference between the two. But uh, for tomato, for example, if you look here, the tomato is this one here. Look at where the losses are occurring. It's different for each country. It depends on the market chain, the value chain. Depends where you're going to lose your produce. When you're looking at amaranth here, <coughs> physical losses, well, in Rwanda, they're getting a lot of retail losses. In Benin, both retail and on-farm losses. Okra, huge losses on-farm, incredible amount of loss. And losses also wholesale and retail. Leafy vegetables are particularly vulnerable, and it's a major problem. We need to get vegetables where they are needed, when they are needed, and in superb condition. Just a story from Fiji. Cabbages are produced in the Singatoka Valley here and have to get to Suva. When they're picked on Thursday morning, they look fantastic. They're wonderful. By the time they have traveled past all these waypoints along the coast and we've reached Sunday, ready for Monday market, they're not looking so pleasant. 
it wouldn't be too difficult to do something about that. So one, that's one of the key constraints to urbanization. It, it's getting, but it must be good because you've just paid a lot of money for it. Let's spray it. Good agricultural practices. A lot of people do not want pesticides contaminating their vegetables. They have heard about good agricultural practices, but the policies are not there to support it. We need support for getting the produce to the market. Vegetables are so perishable. If we want leafy greens in good condition in the market, we have to have good mechanisms and support for the process. We need to have safety mechanisms for food safety, and we have to make sure information is available. Because if the information is not made available to farmers and consumers, how can we blame them for not doing much about their problems? and not being able to influence the policy makers. So if I move on a little bit, change tax slightly, I think everybody has common food and nutrition issues as we sit here in the audience. Um, we've agreed that there's a focus in research and development on the starchy staples to some extent. Um, people are not eating enough vegetables, we know that. There's not much diversity, often. And you often stick with what you're comfortable with. Many people will stick with tomatoes, cabbage, carrots, when there are much healthier things you could be eating. And unfortunately, a lot of communities have skills which could do with a significant amount of enhancement or access to the technologies which they might have been talked about. And we need to make sure that there's an understanding about balanced diets. But governments have been doing that for a long time. We have all these um, myplate.gov from the US. Uh, Taiwan has its own food pyramid equivalent. Uh, Japan, Korea, the European Union. Everybody has what you should be doing. But people don't do it. I mean, here you're forced to eat a lot of vegetables because Sylvia in the cafeteria cooks a lot and they look so good. But if you're cooking them at home, I bet most of you would not be quite as green and vegetable oriented. So one way is to focus more on the younger generation before they are too set in their ways and give them role models. As has happened in the Philippines with the Oh My Gulai campaign, trying to say, if you eat well, you might look like that or... Uh, <laughs> Well, you know what I mean. <laughs> but I think it's an innovative way to try and persuade the younger generation that it's cool to eat vegetables. But the vegetables may not always be available and not where they're needed, when they're needed. So this study in Bangladesh showed, and by the way, here is the FAO WHO recommended daily consumption uh, I've taken a bit of liberty, it's 400 grams of fruit and vegetables. I have just divided it into two and let's say, let's try and get 200 grams of vegetables in ourselves. But in Bangladesh, availability in the summer, very low, huge gap. In winter, a little bit better, but overall you've got 43 grams available out of the 200. Now, there are solutions. It's not so dire. We can improve nutrition at the household level, clearly. We, Helen Keller International does that. Wonderful gardens with animal products as well. We have year-round home gardens. We, we here work very hard on enhancing the skills of our partners and going into homes and looking at recipes, processing. There's ways to enhance this chain, but it's not something new. We've been hearing this morning that we're reinventing the problem again and being very proud that we're trying to get agriculture and health working together. Well, it's nothing new. Um, allotments and home gardens are common in many countries in Europe, um, in Switzerland, in England. You see vegetables growing around the house. It's nothing new. It's having the right seeds in the right place and people knowing how to grow them. So moving back a little bit, 
out of the garden and going to a little more high tech in the sense that you've got protective cultivation, just a simple net house of an improved design here. You can increase yields by 50 to 60 percent, um, decrease pests, provided you shut the doors, which means you need knowledge as well. Um, this is all there. It's available and the farmers then reap the profits, can send the kids to school, they get a good education and hopefully hopefully will go back to agriculture. No, they won't. They'll go and become a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant, or an economist perhaps. <laughs> um, I'll talk later about people moving off the land and into the cities. But an additional advantage, as I said before, you do remove some of the risk of pesticide misuse if you have net houses, protected cultivation. But protected cultivation is expanding. You're getting much more high-tech cultivation from highly mechanized, huge long screen houses and glass houses in Singapore, lots of polytunnels here in Oman. In Taiwan, there's a lot of protected agriculture and Singapore has this mechanism, very restricted land area, about, uh, I think it's 110 acres they use, 110 acres to produce as much food as they can. They want to be self-sufficient in vegetables. They produce less than 12% of what they consume. They're going vertical in these huge, tall glass houses on limited land footprint. So obviously it's profitable. Vegetables do improve incomes from net houses, 10 times the income. You can triple yields with new varieties, quadruple profits. If you don't leave land fallow, you increase your income. And putting a new crop like vegetable soybeans into India, you increase your income. So the income gains from simple production systems are very clear, they are there. And from very intensive production systems, potential gains are even higher where there is a market for the produce. If there is no market, I would suggest that you do not go down that route. You'll just flood the market and you'll make such a big loss that you'll stop producing vegetables. We need to improve the value chain. And before someone says it to me, maybe I should turn the arrows round. The consumer drives the chain. But making a point intervention, unless you know why you're making it, is not a very wise idea. Look at the whole value chain. See what's going on. Because if you make an intervention here, but you have no way of producing and getting to market, it's not going to lead to the impact you expected. But we could look at um, making sure that the plant breeding continues, that seeds that are produced are truthfully labeled, have high germination rate, good marketing chains after the production, and making sure that people eat food which has been prepared properly. We need to get better quality vegetables into the market. We need good harvesting and packing. We need to make sure that we have maybe not high-tech sanitary processing like this in Singapore, but preferably not like this where you don't know where the water has been before it went on your vegetables. Marketing at whatever level, good care of the produce at the market, don't leave it in the sun or on the sandy floor, and making sure that the produce is attractive to the consumers. And it's what they need. In this case, ready prepared vegetables for busy housewives, because I'm guessing the house husbands aren't doing the cooking, I will say the housewives to produce the food when they get home from a busy day working. And just so you know, this Ivy Gourd, sorry, Coccinia grandis, is what is the picture on the background of my presentation. You see the tendril of it. Basically, you need quality produce that meets the needs of the consumer. And to do that, we believe that you need the private sector very well engaged. We have best practice, best practice hubs where we bring the public private sector partners all together to try and make sure we address all their needs rather than having, as we were hearing this morning of David was saying, well, why do you want to ask the people who are going to use our seed? What's the point of doing that? 
we need to do that and find out what they need. We're working towards a common goal. Working with the private sector is not a problem. You just have to remember that we're there for international public goods, they're there for profit, but there is a middle ground, and it does work. Um, we need to look at market chains, processing industries. Um, sorry about that typo. We need to make sure that we increase the availability through processing to make sure that we don't lose the produce. That 40, 50% product loss, vegetable loss, is not acceptable. And this here is Dash Industries in Arusha, looking at ensuring that tomatoes are consumable after the peak of production. We have to make sure that the post-harvest technologies are appropriate. This is an inappropriate post-harvest technology. None of us want to see dogs walking across our our food before we consume it. Um, something like that is probably better. We have different types of solar dryers. We have solar dryers, and uh, this is one from IITA, actually for cassava. Freeze dryers, um, evaporative coolers here, simple, complex, they all have their place. And we're looking not just at preventing deterioration of the produce, but we're looking at eliminating contamination from E. coli, for example, minimizing uh, aflatoxin, aspergillus flavus, and trying to extend shelf life and ensure year-round availability. Vegetables can empower women. These high-value crops, their women have a very important role, either in production, including around the home, post-harvest value addition, and most certainly in the markets and ensuring they're cooked for the family's enjoyment. Nobody has said anything today about people enjoying eating vegetables. Oh, I think, yes, Wolfgang did. He enjoys them. <laughs> but <laughs> vegetable production does empower women, can empower women, and give them not only incomes but a voice in their community. And part of this is through business opportunities. You don't have to start big. In Bangladesh, we can start very small with grafting. And in time, with farmers taking up the seed, grafted seedlings, then with training and support, it can lead to very profitable outcomes, becoming small industries like this, bigger and bigger. With guidance, with information, with mentoring. So empowering women, not all women have the choice of what they feed their children. It depends who comes to the table first and who has priority. But once women understand the need for good nutrition, how to prepare nutritious foods, and if they have ha access to homegrown vegetables, they have more control over what they're producing in the kitchen for their families, and an opportunity to sell extra produce but they need to know how to grow the vegetables well because otherwise they have vegetables with insect damage, rots, and then this lady could make a lot more money if she had good quality products. So there are several ways to look at this, but I believe vegetable production is a very strong way forward to empower women. The quality of our crops, though, is not always very good. We have nutrient-dense crops, traditional vegetables here, very high density, for example, Ibica, one of the highest levels of folate in the world in vegetables. <coughs> However, if you look at conventional global vegetables, cabbage, cucumber, eggplant, this line here is, uh, sorry, the difference between values in 1950 and to 1999. If a value is below that black line, it means a reduction in the nutritional value within that crop. So many of them have reduced nut nutritional content. However, they're very good with consistent size, attractive, consistent color, long shelf life. Good at that, less good for you to eat. Globalization, is it an opportunity? We get competition. 
And you'll see, however, that the countries we work in, these are exports of fresh vegetables. European Union, over 55% of the total vegetable exports. US, Canada, Mexico, Asia, Southern Hemisphere, Middle East, Central America, and others. Fresh vegetable ex exports. And there are plenty of organizations, but what I want to highlight here, we have sanitary and phytosanitary measures, codex, quality, size, tolerances, presentation. There is nothing there about nutrition. People need information, business skills, creates jobs. They can get information, for example, using mobile telephones and data sharing. However, it looks really nice here, but to charge their mobile phones, they might be having to go to this gentleman here to try and charge their phones up. You have to be careful what you recommend. Uh, in Sri Lanka, you have very nice displays at um, collecting um, facilities where the farmer can withhold his crop until the price has gone from three to six, and yes, I'll sell here. And then, oops, it went up to 16, oh well. But at least the information is available, and they can get rid of their produce at a better time, rather than selling at four o'clock in the afternoon for three rupees, or, and then moving on. Data is available, we just have to get it out there. Now, I want to talk about something that was alluded to earlier, Seasonality. Is it a problem or is it a solution? Personally, I think it is an advantage so long as you do not want to eat the same thing year round. You can produce around you in the, uh, not so far away, maybe 20, 30, 40, 50 kilometers. Why do you need to eat strawberries every day? We can eat them here in the winter. But why do you want to eat them every day and go and pay a lot of money for it and carbon footprint and so on? Um, there's innovative marketing, post-harvest treatment. I will admit that you can get a bit tired in Taiwan of pineapples during the pineapple season or bananas, but you can preserve them. Why do we think seasonality is a problem? We're always trying to expand seasons. We're trying to get a bit more money at either end of the season but maybe we should focus on seasons. That's just a question for you. Grafting. AVRDC knows that grafting is a great solution for biotic stresses and some of the abiotic stresses. In Vietnam, in some areas, grafting has been taken up big time for tomatoes. But why do we have to keep to using a lot of labor? Why don't we use high throughput grafting? a lot of automation, it's available. And from what I'm reading, you can have these big machines, they still take an operator, or maybe two. Why do you want 100 people? It's a question for you. Um, they're doing 900 graphs per hour or more, and very effective. Just keep that in your mind. Automation is not necessarily bad. And just for a bit of fun, we can have some fun grafting for the Irishman men in the audience. Let's put our tomato on top of the potato and have a pomato. It's done, it's available, it's for sale. Or a fruit salad tree, um, citrus fruits all on one, stone fruits all on one, lots of different apples on one tree. It's a novelty, but why not? There's an opportunity there. There's an opportunity for grafting different Solanaceae onto tree tomatoes. If you look at this, this is a tree from Cassettes Art University's Cassette Fair, when one of our friends, Dr. Syracle, and her team grafted cherry tomatoes, processing tomatoes, multiple types of eggplants and chilies all onto one tree. <laughs> you laugh, but yes, it's a novelty. But 
scientists may be able to turn that into a positive advantage. Seasonality issues, disease resistance issues, think about it. Environmental management, there's a lot that can be done. Protected cultivation, I've shown you those. Using light emitting diodes, here we are. Very cheap to run, don't get too hot. Bearing in mind that whether you use blue or red affects the flavor and micronutrient content. You can get vitamin A rich lettuce, very high lycopene tomatoes using the right LED mixtures. Uh, Tamagawa University in Japan is working on this a lot. Um, power could be an issue. Management, nice opportunity for computers, smartphones, and all those gadgets that the teenagers are walking around with in their pockets, and most of us, I think. And some easier post-harvest management here. But remember, every time you do protective cultivation, you're battling too hot, too cold, you're battling too humid, too dry. And remember, you've just kept all the pollinators out if you needed them. Just bear that in mind. And given that the vacuum cleaner was not in everyone's house not that long ago, um, why can't we get our technologies available cheap, easy, on the shelf, and so you can all produce vegetables anytime. I mean, these are probably going a little more fancy than I would recommend, but they're there. They're growing very nice tomatoes with LEDs and so on. Aeroponics at airports in the US, it's doable, but you need it as a kit, or you need to be able to pick the bits up really easily in your corner store, and that it's easy to put together. At the moment, it's not but everyone's got a vacuum cleaner. 100 years ago, you wouldn't have known how to use that either, but now you do. So technologies for the home. This is the vegetable version of the vacuum cleaner. Aquaponics, you basically could have fish and then growing vegetables, circulating the water with the nutrients. You could have uh, phones to tell you that water's not flowing, phone messages, text messages, you can grow them in your house against a window, fish in here, pump the water through. If there's a kit available, I, you might do it for fun. But if it's not available, you're not going to do it. So we need to get the technologies simple so that any of us could just go and buy it and do it at home. Module farming, high tech. Conveyor belts of vegetables going through in Indiana, Illinois, LEDs all over the place, streamlined, very intensive production, potential risks, power cut. What happens then? What happens with a contaminant in the water? A lot of these are greens that are eaten raw, but very productive. And then you can go even more fun. Why not? You can have these modules where the plants are growing inside, LEDs here, you see the circular vegetables growing, take it one further step. You're going to have a whole <laughs> vertical tower with all these little modules in here growing vegetables. Professor Lee wouldn't be very happy because there's no sunshine there, <laughs> but it's a possibility. I think we have to think out of the box a little bit. Now, GMOs. Is this the way to go? I was lucky enough to spend an extra two minutes with Professor Lee, and he had said that GMOs were not the solution. Why he said that was because it also required soil, fertilizers, sunshine. It's not going to be the solution. It will still take resources. It will contribute to a solution. I mean, we have um, soybean and so on, peppers, these are the ones that are commonly known to be genetically modified, but when you look at commercial approval, uh, USA has nine commercial approvals, Australia has 11. Um, but if you look, Flavor Saver Tomato went out of fashion, um, and the other commercial one, Chicory, Seedlink Chicory. 
uh, not widely grown either for various reasons. But they are available, they are a potential solution. I want to give you another potential solution for food waste, food loss, irradiation. It's comparable to pasteurizing milk, which was probably really scary the first time it was done. The product is left fresh and is much safer than before it went through the irradiation. You're using cobalt-60, irradiating, and what it's doing is reducing spoilage. To me, that's the most important, but it goes from sprouting and stops mushrooms from opening up. Um, but one thing it does is destroy pathogens, where there's about 5,000 deaths a year and 76 million illnesses a year in the U.S. that could be controlled by irradiation. It's expensive to set up, but once it's set up, it can just move through conveyor belt system. Gamma irradiation is permitted in many countries. Interestingly, it depends on where you are. And I was very surprised to see that Pakistan and Brazil will accept irradiation of any, any food whatsoever to any dose. And they do. Um, European Union, it's single foods, but about 500,000 metric tons a year are irradiated. And the food is much safer. And I know personally that strawberries that go through irradiation stay fresh for much longer. We need to change mindsets. We need to influence people. Um, one problem we're going to have, farmers are growing older. First column is 1970, 1998, 70, 98. This is the percentage of farmers aged 65 years and older. US, Canada, Japan, Korea. The farming population is getting older. Youngsters are not going into farming. We need to get a new generation of agricultural scientists. We need a new generation of farmers to feed a, feed a growing population. Now, uh, people have been talking about SDSN, Sustainable Development Goals, post-2015. And I've been linked with goal six, which is on agriculture, not nutrition. But interestingly, and I'm very proud to say that I had some of the influence onto that, the group working on goal six is led by Achim Doberman of IRI, and does actually include a previous board member of ours, Molly Jan. And if you look at the topics, that the key issues that are highlighted, healthier diets, supply of safe and nutritious food, um, reducing food losses and waste, that should, in theory, perhaps be under nutrition, but the agriculture group want to keep it firmly in agriculture. Also looking at empowering women, preserving the environment, and policies. Now, the take-home messages that I would like to challenge you with I believe we need to take bigger steps with new thinking. We do incremental changes at the moment. It's okay, but why not take bigger steps by thinking out of the box? Do something different, take a bit of a risk. And we need sustainable and equitable goals. Equitable in the sense of gender, environment, policy. We need those. The second message is development is good but we need a, probably a different kind of development, not the old business as usual model. Uh, we need to keep um, agriculturalists on the farm. Don't pull them into the cities or get new kids out from university who are willing to go into agriculture. We need to educate them that agriculture is good, horticulture, vegetable production, but it requires a broad education. The idea of being, a, being so focused on something that you're actually a specialist in nothing at the end, um, absolutely. We need generalists and we're not finding them. And I don't think we should be afraid of new technologies. However, we must communicate better. Most new technologies that go out and fall by the wayside is because of poor communication. Scientists communicate really badly, usually, 
and we need to find people who can communicate well to deliver the message, to get it out there, that GMOs are not that scary, really. Unless they're produced in someone's garage in back street somewhere and are totally unregulated. But we're used to that with pesticides. There's regulation and some slip through on the side. So I think, yeah, and public opinion is really fickle and we have to play with it and get it going in the right direction. But basically, I think if we can follow these goals here for goal six of improving agriculture and look at goal five, nutrition, look at those. And I believe vegetables fit very well in here and will enable us to move to better prosperity for the poor and health for all. Thank you. given us a, a rich menu of ideas, challenges, opportunities. Uh, one big challenge for us is going to is to find out how the, how very well uh, some of the ideas you put to us dovetail with goal number five and goal number six. Uh, just to refresh your memory as you start uh, getting ready to pose your questions. Some of the ideas uh, and the take home message, taking risks, think outside the box, uh, different kind of development approaches and strategies, keep agriculture and agriculture rich on the land, on the farm, and not in the cities, even though urban populations are uh, exponentially increasing and you'll have to uh, begin to produce near where the populations are. Um, you need generalists, and it seems like we're going full circle. There was a time when we thought we need specialists. Maybe it's a question of balancing the two. So the floor is open for discussions. What I would propose is that you pose your question. Uh, we'll take two or three or four at the beginning. Jackie will note those questions, and I will also help to note them. I will give Jackie the floor to respond. And then, depending on how we're doing for time, we'll take another set of okay. Emmy, first. And while I'm taking the name, you can uh, also show your hands. David. Wolfgang. One more. Gentleman in the back. Shibley. Oh, Shibley. Yes, Shibley. Okay, Evie, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie, for a really inspiring presentation. And it leads me to my question. Where do you see that the leadership, the global leadership for horticulture and for horticultural development and focusing on vegetables as an element of nutrition going forward is? Where is that leadership? It always seems as though horticulture, vegetable, fruit and vegetables are kind of the last in the list, right? People talk about animal source food, people talk about staple crops, but then fruits and vegetables are kind of the, the tail wagging the dog, perhaps. So where is that leadership? And how do you see the possibility of ABRDC helping to mobilize that leadership more broadly so that it's not just your sole voice here, but that, in fact, it's a voice, it's a whole chorus of folks saying, we really need to move outside of the box and move toward this future that you outlined. Thank you, Amy. David? I know, uh, thank you also, Jackie, for that presentation, which I enjoyed very much. I, I wanted to ask a question about food waste, which is a recurring theme that we've heard through the day. Uh, so much food is lost, and, and there need to be ways found to, uh, to address that concern. And then we also talked a good deal about the importance of sanitation and food safety. And you raised up the issue of these use-by dates as a problematic because they lead to food waste, and yet they also are intended to protect food safety. How do we find some middle ground around that particular question? Thank you, David Wolfgang. Thank you, Jackie, for your inspiring presentation. My question is uh, already asked by Emmy. Um, 
with other words, where do you see ABRDC in this context? Shibli? Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, Jacqueline uh, for his nice pictorial and database presentation. Uh, I just want to uh, update the data regarding Bangladesh, as you mentioned, the 21 uh, gram and the 171 gram there. So as per the Bangladesh Bureau of Statistics data, the uh, per capita consumption is 55 gram, and the project area where we were working, it has been increased uh, up to 110 gram by the CB, the CB ADIDC, yeah, as one of the implementer of uh, horticulture project. So that's one of the target, and uh, you know, uh, my question is, I guess my question is, you know, you have, we have seen a lot of, uh, you know, new technologies over here for your presentation, like, you know, hydroaquaponic, hydroponic, and the, you know, the model farming. So, uh, uh, are those technologies user friendly for the farmers level, especially, like, you know, for Bangladesh, and can we uh, expand those technologies uh, through the CBIDC? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, global leadership for vegetables. Um, I would like to think it's us, but I'm not sure it's us per se, but we've had a strong role in influencing over the past few years, and maybe over the past 40 years, hopefully. Some of our donors are very convinced, very, very convinced, and support us and spread the story with us. So that is a big positive. However, they also have to look at other things. They have to look at maternal and child health. They have to look at uh, malaria and all these other things. So we are just one component of what any of our donors has to deal with. Many countries have it on their agenda, but vegetables do go quite low in the list of priorities. However, with some work on those policies, in some areas such as uh, West Africa, vegetables, the understanding of the need and the use and utility of vegetables has gone up. Having said that, I would very much like AVRDC to be able to mobilize a lot more in many more public arenas to be able to influence a lot more. Because we are very small and I think it's all our partners and friends who will help drive the story. Many of our national partners fully understand the need, but they have so many priorities. Whenever they can, they speak up, but it's not enough to get things done. We need to get the bigger governments, who do broadly understand, but I must point out not all donors, especially some of the big ones, do not have vegetables anywhere on their radar. So maybe we should be influencing even more. And I wish AVRDC could do that. Better new public relations, a different style perhaps, could be the way forward. Looking at food waste and food safety and use-by dates, I think the problem is that we have a plethora of phrasings on these labels. We have best before, we have used by, and something else. And they don't all mean the same thing. Sell by. Sell by. Well, when it's sold, it's still good to eat, possibly for a week or more. And if you eat spoiled yogurt, it doesn't mean you're going to be sick. It's just going to taste a bit different. There has to be, truly, <laughs> so as it, even if it goes a bit, mo cheese is moldy, that has a sell-by date on it and a use-by date. But the longer you keep it, the better it tastes. I mean, let's be sensible about this. And if I ever found a bottle of wine with a sell-by date on, I would not be happy. Um, I think there's not a good understanding of what those labels mean. Perhaps not even in some of those smaller supermarkets. And at the end of the day, it was uh, best before today. And best before doesn't mean it's not edible tomorrow, but out it goes. And they can't, in Britain anyway, they can't even give it to the orphanage or the homeless center. It's against the law. That, to me, is a tragic waste of very good food. And 
The question about using high tech technologies in developing or less where the technology isn't yet. I'm going to put it that way because those technologies are not commonly used. I think there are issues that need to be addressed depending on the environment you're working in. If you've got a highly humid environment and you've got storms coming in and so on, you have to be careful. So I truly believe that when I go to see what we generally say the poor farmers, and say, here's a nice low-tech solution for you. I do not like that. I think that anybody should have the vision of what could be done. You may not want to do it now, and you may need to form a cooperative or something like that. But in the specific case, you need to make sure the technology is available. And where I was saying that in the house, you need to have, if you want to grow your vegetables at home with uh, aquaponics, I think all of us would be much more comfortable if you could go and pick up a kit in a store with instructions and then you do it and hopefully it works. I think the same thing is true for the high-tech module farming. It's not truly tried and tested for hot, humid environments. But I don't think that's a reason to just drop it aside. I think it needs a bit of work and it could be a solution. Did you, did you please, uh, yes. Yeah. I think we have uh, time for perhaps two or three more questions. Uh, you'll have to give me your names, please. <laughs> yes. Srini. 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 And Tony. One more. Please. Tony. Tony. <laughs> Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, thoughtful talk. Um, I have a sim similar question than uh, uh, Wolfgang had before. I mean, you see that in this vegetable um, uh, domain, the private sector is hyperactive. And um, where do you see the role, or where do you see in this panoply the role of AURDC? What can AURDC do? And what would you prefer other actors to do? What can you do best? Where is your, your comparative advantage? <coughs> Thank you, Jackie, for, for the excellent presentation. You have shown evidences for uh, the population that actively engaged in uh, agriculture is quite aging population. What's your forecast in the next decade? Uh, this trend will continue or there will be changes and how the center is going to get uh, get uh, adopt to address this uh, issue in the next decade. Thanks Jackie for a uh, very powerful and inspiring presentation. Um, two questions. The first one is of all of the issues that you presented, what are the top three constraints to lack of achievement of greater impact through through vegetable growing? What are the, the real things that, that, that could be addressed collectively? Yeah, and the second one is relates to that balance between um, growing your own vitamins or micronutrients versus income for the family. And if you if you have to balance those two, let's say in 1973, 80% of the effort was on grow your own vitamins and, and micronutrients and 20% on, on income. Today, let's say it's 50-50. Where's it going to be in 20 years' time? What's the, what's the balance and emphasis? Is it, it, do you see more effect and impact coming from your work through the income dimension? Or do you see more on the homegrown nutrition opportunities for the households to develop nutrition? Where, where's your sense of balance? You want both, and it's a win-win, but where's the balance of effort? Mm. <laughs> okay, our comparative advantage as AVRDC, the World Vegetable Center, is that we have an absolutely fantastic gene bank. We have the genetic resources, 
surpassing all available, publicly available genetic resources. Our scientists can mine those resources freely, fully, at any time. And so can all our partners. I think that's one of our biggest things. We also have the freedom to do our plant breeding to address nutritional needs. We don't focus on consistent size. I mean, we like consistent size because it's easy to measure and so on, but we focus also on nutrition. And that is something the private sector is not doing. Occasionally they do, yes, one or two of them, I must admit. However, in general, it's shelf life, consistent size produce, and so on. And not so often for taste either. So we are interested in taste because we feel that, well, we know many of us personally that if it tastes good, you're going to eat it and you're going to want it again. One of our big successes is also that we produce international public goods in everything. We restrict nothing. So we are a source of information, technology, genes, technology, seeds, information, globally. That is one of our big advantages. It's also a little bit of a negative because we never get known for some of it. <laughs> so our genes go out to the private sector, but we don't know what they do with it. So it's a quandary. I hope that's answered enough for now, or maybe we can discuss later. <laughs> um, aging agricultural population. Um, what are we going to do about it? Should we be putting technologies that you don't have to bend down to do or something? I, I don't think so because I believe that in the future governments are going to have to look at this very seriously and I don't think it's particularly an issue for us. We need to get good food production going. I think governments in general are going to have to look at their aging populations, they're going to have to work with the education sector, they're going to have to make agriculture a positive thing to go for, not something that an uneducated person might do because they can do nothing better. Maybe we need fewer, with apologies to anyone who is a professor here, um, maybe we need fewer degrees, maybe we need more um, emphasis on diplomas, practical training for farmers. In the UK at the moment we have so many degrees, but people are still not farming. I mean, there, there must be a way of dealing with it that does not involve us, because I don't think we can actually impact on that. And maybe we can encourage universities to teach more agriculture, that might help. Um, Three things that reduce the, uh, well, nutrients versus growing, I mean, nutrients, money, grow your own or not. I think it very much depends on where you are and what level you're at. But basically, most people enjoy growing something for themselves. Whatever it is, they love it. Gives you a bit of empowerment in your kitchen or pick your own food. I think it's a basic human love to grow your own. And I think we shouldn't sideline that. And it will have a contribution to nutrition in urban areas or in rural areas. It's not such an issue. Um, things that are prevent, well, causing difficulties in getting vegetables out there and getting them eaten, one of the things to me is actually misuse of pesticides. That's really scary to me because it's not visible. And that for those who know a little, uh, that's a big problem. Um, I think yeah. that you may want to continue that with Tony over a beer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I want to take this opportunity, first of all, to ask you uh, on your behalf uh, to give me permission to thank Jackie for uh, clearly a very well thought out presentation. You set out to challenge us in terms of fresh ideas and look, taking a fresh look at indeed the, um, the menu of issues and ideas that you put on the table does open up a lot of possibilities 
for uh, looking at the contribution of vegetables to some of the problems for goals number five and six. So thank you very much, very appreciated. On my own behalf, I'd like to thank you uh, for your participation, for the enthusiasm with which you uh, uh, approach uh, this discussion. It's been very inspiring. And um, I know that Jackie has to change. <laughs> <laughs> I have to put my blue on. <laughs> and so I think perhaps this is a good time to let you go so that you can be right on time for the picture. We come back here at 1600 hours, and I leave you in the hands of my colleagues in Canada.